Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, it's Brian Zane here to tell you about this week's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Now, normally I'd let one of my side characters explain Surfshark to you, but this is far too important a matter to leave to one of them. Let's talk about Peacock. That's where the WWE Network currently lives in America, and it's not the best layout in the world, not the best organization in the world. It's not complete. This Look at this layout. My God, what, what is this? What is this? How am I supposed to get through all of this? Oh, December to Dismember 2006 is an ECW classic. News to me. Need Needless to say, it's not a perfect system. So why should we Americans suffer when the rest of the world can enjoy the old WWE Network the way it was intended? Well, you can do that here in America with Surfshark. I'm going over here to my server and I'm switching from the US to the United Kingdom. And from there, I can access the old network that, as you remember it, I can log in with my old account and reset it with PayPal and bingo bango. I can access the network as I did just a couple of months ago. I can watch all the old nitros I want. I can watch anything I want from the network that's there and I can do it through Surfshark. It's really amazing and it works folks, trust me. You can support this channel by downloading Surfshark at the link at the top of this description. Use the promo code REGRET to get 83% off your order plus an extra three months for free. And there are a lot of other advantages to the VPN I could tell you about, but why bother? Old network, you can get it now. What more do you need? Thanks for watching everybody and enjoy this week's review. Well, by early 1998, ECW was still continuing its big expansion and cementing its status as the number three or possibly two promotion in North America. But you can't have growth without some growing pains. Is this the worst pay-per-view in ECW's history if you don't count December to December 2006? And why would you? It's Wrestlepalooza 1998 from May 3rd at the Cobb County Civic Center in Marietta, Georgia. It is ECW's first event in Georgia and it's being billed as ECW invading enemy territory because this is Ted Turner's backyard, the home of WCW in nearby Atlanta. Fun fact, by the way, the last WCW show to run out of this venue was in 1991. 3,400 folks saw at the venue, about 75,000 pay-per-view buys. Joey Styles running solo on commentary here. He opens the show by saying, we will never forget the name of... <sighs> Wrestlepalooza. Well, not exactly that way, but it would have been cool if he did. In your opening matchup, you get the full-blooded Italians, that's little Guido and Tracy Smothers with the Big Don, Tommy Rich at ringside, versus the Blue Meanie and Supernova, the BWO. And I already love this segment before things even really get going, because I love the FBI's shtick here. I love Tracy Smothers in this role. Uh, the Blue Meanie and the Supernova are pretty funny, too. The crowd's totally into this. Before the bell even rings, before they even do a single wrestling move, they got the crowd in the palm of their hands. It's great. Great work. Nova with a nice bulldog leg drop combo on the FBI. Meany and Guido get tagged in and suddenly Rich gets on the mic and says they want to do a rematch of the dance contest they had a week or two ago on television, so we get a dance break. The movements that Smothers and Meany make do not resemble dancing in any way, shape, or form, but they do get a reaction. Referee John Finnegan's got better moves. Smothers has had enough and the match resumes. Some miscommunication between the FBI turns into one of the most hilarious sequences I've ever seen in wrestling involving referee body slams at the end. It's hilarious. Nova gets to fly, but he's cut off by Rich on the outside. The heels work over Nova for a while, but he catches Guido in an electric chair with a running slam called the Scream Machine, which is nice. Meany with the hot tag. We get this weird collision between Guido and Smothers. Meany goes up top. Big Don with a distraction. The Meany salt is missed. Guido with a flag attack, but Nova hits him with a Nova cane, and they get the win. I give it three stars out of five, and honestly, it's my personal favorite match on this show, and only because of the first five minutes of that thing, because all the shtick and the gaga they did was so entertaining, it got me in the right frame of mind to watch some damn wrestling for the rest of this night. It was great. The end of the match got a little clunky at times, but overall, very entertaining, and it did what it had to do. Up next, the grudge match as Just Incredible takes on Mikey Whiprack. Last year, Mikey picked up some upset wins on the young Credible and snapped his unbeaten streak, but then Credible snapped Mikey leg in return and put him on the shelf for several months. Mikey comes back in March with the leg still in a brace, but he wants a fight with Credible, and miraculously, the knee injury is just not a problem in this match. Credible comes to the ring with Jason, the sexiest man on earth, and Chastity. Mikey starts out guns blazing, fight on the outside, and hurling Justin into the barricade, then flung right into a fucking cage.
kid in the front row. The kid's like stunned after that, just sits down kind of a daze as the fight's happening. how did that not turn into a lawsuit? Mikey gets flung off the apron and lands back first into the barricade. Ouch. Now Justin takes over, drives Mikey face first into a chair, then a knee into said chair pinned to his face, then a powerbomb on said chair. The crowd's chanting all doe, all doe at him, which is a reference to his past life in the World Wrestling Federation as Aldo Montoya. The whippersnapper attempt is countered into a reverse DDT, which I've never actually seen that done before. Double teaming on the outside by the baddies. Mikey throwing a chair at Justin. The chair hits another fan. Mikey with a superplex off the barricade through a table. And what I like about this spot in particular, you can see Justin struggling to get both feet up on the barricade. And after a while, Mikey's like, fuck it, you're going over. Back in the ring, each man with a chair. Justin misses, but Mikey doesn't. We get a slingshot into a chair in the corner. Nice counter by Mikey into a whippersnapper, then one to Jason, then a super whippersnapper to Chastity, who I'm pretty sure was never trained to wrestle. That's incredible pile driver on the chair for Justin to pull out the win. I give it three and a half stars out of five. You know, we've seen this story told before where the fiery baby face, the big comeback and beats up all the goons and then the heel swoops in at the end to, uh, to get the win. But this one was executed fairly well. And also there were a few innovative moments in this match that things I'd never really seen done before. And so yeah, objectively, probably the best match in the card. In the upper deck, you got Joey Styles doing his stand up when Balls Mahoney and Axel Rodden interrupt and say they want their tag title matchup right now. Out come the tag team champions, Chris Candido and Lance Storm, the most dysfunctional team you'll ever see in ECW right now, because right now Lance and Chris hate each other in the current angle, because Lance is a prospect, not an official member of the Triple Threat, and he and Candido won the Tag Team Championships. Somewhere along the way, Candido was fed a lie that his wife, Sonny, had the hots for Lance, and so now like he hates Lance, and they just fight all the time, but now they're the champions, and so the thing is, there's a statement from Paul Heyman where he says that neither man can screw the other out of the Tag Team Championships. You can't cost the other guy the match and the championships because if you do that you will be fired so the workaround of this is like every week you've got Storm and Candido fighting Mahoney and Rodden and usually it's for the tag belts and every time they're fighting you've got Storm and Candido beating each other up as the match goes on but always breaking up the pin because then technically they won't be in trouble for costing the other team the other guy the match it's a very interesting workaround but like some of the dynamic here between Chris and Storm is very interesting so the champs are in the ring and balls and axle are still standing up in the crows and that's the styles I'm like oh yeah we need to go down there too and wouldn't you know a wrestling match breaks out in ecw axel rotten trading moves with candido and storm early on mahoney gets a run then rotten with a sloppy joe sandwich on everyone axel throwing some flare chops which gets some woos followed by a free rick flair chant from the georgia crowd this was for context by the way this is like right in the midst of when flair was sued by eric bischoff and wcw for no showing an episode of thunder to be at one of reed flair's wrestling meets after getting beaten up for a bit axel Axel thwarts some double teaming by the champs and tags in balls. Suddenly, Sonny, who we've not seen on TV for weeks up to this point, shows up and gets involved in the match. Uh, I was wondering where she'd gone in all this. Storm saves her from Doom, which makes Candido upset. Nice springboard dropkick by Storm to Mahoney with a chair assist. He goes to the cover. Candido hits his own partner with a chair so he can make the cover and take the glory and win for his team. The champions brawl their way to the back and fight over who gets to hold both the belts. I am the tag team champions. I give it two and a half stars out of five. This match is right down the middle for me. I thought it was nothing spectacular, but nothing terrible either. And it was interesting to see the continuing, you know, dynamic with Candido and Storm, which by this point had been going on for a while. Let's kind of keep it going here. I like the idea or the angle where you have a dysfunctional tag team and stuff, though in ECW at this time, they do kind of lay it on thick and not just from Candido and Storm. We'll see some of that later in this very show. The last time I can recall a team like this where they hate each other, but they can make it work when they try is Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit in 2002 which coincidentally was written by Paul Heyman. Now it's time for a lull period in the show as ECW honors some Georgia legends, beginning with the junkyard dog who's making his final on-air appearance before he dies one month later in a car crash. Got Dirty Dick Slater, the masked superstar, aka Bill Eady, aka Demolition Axe, and Bullet Bob Armstrong. And you know, for a company whose one of its most infamous moments involves them shitting all over the NWA, it's kind of ironic that they're here honoring like NWA legends here at this event. Event. And it seems like 1998 was a big year for honoring territorial legends because the World Wrestling Federation did that very same thing at least two or three different pay-per-views the same year. And speaking of shitting all over the past, here comes Shane Douglas, ECW champion, leader of the Triple Threat, and walking hospital ward. The man's working through a litany of injuries at the moment, including a busted elbow, a broken palate, a cracked cheekbone, and a ruptured and infected sinus. And you know this because this list of injuries is
is repeated several times throughout the show. Shane cut in the same promo here. He continues to do this very day about how he came in at a time when wrestling wasn't an entertainment, it was a sport. He takes a shot at Shawn Michaels, which the fans like. Then he takes a shot at Ric Flair, which the fans don't like. In Georgia, WCW territory, who would have guessed? He says his title match against Al Snow tonight may be the last match of his career because of his injuries, and the fans will remember him for decades. Then Taz appears, Shane's biggest rival at the moment, and the man who considers himself the uncrowned world champion wants Shane to hand the belt to him. Shane refuses. He gets put in a submission by Taz before he's dragged out by security. Taz is arrested, apparently, and thrown into a car where he kicks the windows out of. You know, between this and the Legends moment that preceded it, I get the feeling this is a lot of time where they're just trying to pad for time on this show. Meanwhile, back in the ring, Shane's bleeding from the mouth and his triple threat cohort Bam Bam Bigelow sticks around for his match, a fight against New Jack. Bam Bam on top at first, but he starts to go over weapons, which proves to be his undoing. New Jack takes over with many weapons shots. On the outside, Bigelow takes over, makes New Jack bleed, and keeps things interesting by launching himself over the barricade. Fighting in the crowd, Bam Bam looks up and telegraphs, something's gonna happen on that balcony soon, then knocks himself out by missing New Jack. Jack slowly crawls up to the balcony with the help of security, grabs a guitar from a fan and just falls down on top of Bigelow and it looks terrible and apparently knocks himself out. I don't know if the guitar bounces off of Bigelow and back up into his face and knocks him cold or what. It looks pretty ugly here. Bigelow's bleeding now. He just forces New Jack onto his shoulders, carries him back into the ring. Bam Bam using his mobility, hobility, and Joe-bility to hit greetings from Asbury Park and wins. Throws a trash can on him for good measure afterward. Yeah, I'm gonna give this one zero stars out of five. Not even the shock value of New Jack's fall or the virtue of the right man winning the match is going to be enough for me to put it into the positive star territory here. These two styles just didn't mesh well. Bigelow can brawl, but just in a situation like with New Jack matches, it just doesn't work here. Also, apparently New Jack didn't do himself very many favors in this one. He admitted in later interviews he was pretty high on cocaine when this match happened, which explains why he gets blown up and totally gassed so early in the match. A hardcore tag match up next as Tommy Dreamer and the Sandman take on the Dudley Boys. A couple of months earlier, Earlier in Florida, the Dudleys had this bit where they were bringing out the Bushwhackers, seemingly as their newest members, wearing the team colors and everything. The fans are shitting all over this. It's funny that in 1998, the Bushwhackers, oh, they're old and over the hill, and they brought them back like three years later for WrestleMania 17 in the Battle Royal. So anyway, Sandman and Dreamer come out because what's the meaning of this then? And it's a trap. The Dudleys beat up Dreamer and Sandman. Sandman taking a bad looking 3D and appears to jam his neck. He's carted off with a neck injury, returns several weeks later by way of teleportation with a neck brace. He's back and now we got ourselves a tag team match. After their big entrance, the gang spits beer into the faces of the Dudleys. Bubba and Devon sell forever as Big Dick can't quite get over the top rope and the match is on. Brawling on the outside, Sandman is throwing a table at Bubba and it's a miracle he didn't hit anyone in the front row with it. Big leg drop from the heavens by Sandman onto the Dudleys. What makes that shot hilarious is you don't see him jump, he just flies into the picture like a rocket. Lots of weird audio in this show and this match it becomes really prevalent, but there's a lot of this weird audio mixing with the crowd noise on this show and it makes you wonder it's like it doesn't sound like it's natural like something having to do with the sound mixing caused it to be like that or perhaps just the, the sound from the original feed was so bad this is the network's way of trying to conceal it or make it sound better but in doing that it sounds just like it's totally muffled and in some cases dead quiet. Sandman is hurled into a barricade and immediately tenses up selling the neck he's carted off in a stretcher and run out of the arena but like nobody seems all that shocked about it there's no like, applause for him it's really strange. Dudley's with a two-on-one advantage and they spend several minutes beating the hell out of Dreamer. Sign Guy Dudley throws powder, but he misses the mark and it's Devon instead, a short-lived comeback attempt. In comes Spike Dudley to make a save against his brothers. He helps out with some acid drops, then gets laid out on the outside. Sign Guy and Big Dick interfere a lot. Beulah takes Sign Guy to Dick Kick City, hits the DDT on him. We get a 3D to Spike, then the Sandman returns with a neck brace, starts swinging. Big Dick takes multiple cane shots, a big chair shot, cane shot combo to Bubba and Devon, a double DDT and Dreamer and Sandman win. I give it two and a half stars out of five. You know, this is just more of the wild and squirrely bordering on overbooking uh, type of match. We see with like, these four guys in particular time and time again over the years, but it worked for them. They made it work and they made it last for several years. And this one, it's not their best work here. I would argue that the Dudleyville Street fight a couple of months later in Heat Wave is a much better match when it becomes a six man with Spike and Big Dick officially added in there. But yeah, just seeing Sandman with a neck brace still able to beat one of the best 
tag teams in the world, the best one in ECW at that point, a little rich for my tastes. This next match had a lot of hype and ballyhoo going into it for the ECW television title as Rob Van Dam defense against his own tag team partner and friend Sabu. These guys are another odd couple in ECW, rivals turned friends, even though like, every promo sees RVD just busting Sabu's balls and calling him an idiot and Sabu just kind of looks pissed and that's all that is. The two are held together basically by manager Bill Alfonso who represents them both. Sabu's earned a TV title shot against Bam Bam Bigelow at Wrestlepalooza, but a few weeks before this, RVD has been ordered to soften up Bigelow, which is also for the title, which seems like a plan that's guaranteed to backfire. Sure enough, RVD wins the TV title, beginning his historic two-year reign with it after Sabu helps him win. Then Alfonso's informed, yeah, so that means your two guys are fighting for the belt now, which again, Fonzie did not seem to foresee. And every week you've got something where Sabu costs RVD a match, or RVD costs Sabu a match. In fact, on like one of the last episodes of TV, RVD just throws in the towel for his partner Sabu, even though Sabu is pinning and going to beat Al Snow in this matchup here. Fonzie vows to be in the corner of both men tonight. We saw a cool promo where you'd have Sabu standing next to him. Am I going to be in Sabu's corner? Holds the belt right up to the camera and blows the whistle. He pulls it back and Sabu and RVD have switched in and out of the shot. Or am I going to be in Rob Van Dam's corner, daddy? I thought that was a pretty neat move. Jeff Jones, the crooked official on hand for this one, it's established that he is in the pocket of Alfonso, so we'll see if this plays into the match. RVD wants to have the match end by having Sabu lay down for him, but Boo's having none of that kicks him in the head. Sabu with many flying moves. Back in the ring, they trade some flips. RVD gains the advantage. A big surfboard stretch attempt was made. They get close. A couple minutes later, RVD brings out a table and bridges it on the barricade when Sabu dives onto him. Sabu goes for another dive on the table. Van Dam moves behind the barricade. Sabu just lands on the barricade, breaks the table in the process, dives onto RVD anyway. More brawling on the outside. RVD wants Fonzie to hold a chair in place, but Bill won't do it. Bill is still shouting instructions and orders to both Sabu and Van Dam all throughout the match, and Joey Styles gets more and more exasperated every time it happens. Like he just can't grasp that Alfonso is just trying to, you know, play both sides so he benefits either way. Oh, he's talking to Van Dam now? He was just talking to Sabu a minute earlier. I can't make heads or tails of this guy. A big ass acai moonsault over the barricade to Van Dam. Rob eats a chair, but he avoids the triple jump moonsault. RVD with a nice plancha to Sabu on the outside. We get another table bridge, another chair throw. As the match goes on, Sabu's offense becomes like more and more chair throwing, but he has like 70% chair throwing. He goes to the big springboard onto the table with the DDT, and it does not look good. The table does not want to break. They just kind of fall down in a heap. Looks pretty bad. It's been done better, let's just say. Boo with a hurricane rana off the top rope and through a table. Sabu then immediately leans over the apron and throws up. Good for him. Van Dam with a ridiculous guillotine leg drop off the top and on the apron. Back on the outside, a hurricane rana off the guardrail by Sabu. No vomit. Van Daminator in the ring. A five-star frog splash fourth officially called that. A kick out at two. RVD with a big old monkey flip onto a chair. Sabu grabbing another table. It falls apart as he sets it up and they cover for it the best they can. The fans still boo. Sabu is on the table. RVD with the height on that frog splash through it. At this point, these guys seem to be totally gassed and appear to be just making up sequences as they go. The crowd noise mixing on this feed does not help the match feel any more exciting. More big moves, more kickouts, then the bell rings. It's a time limit draw at 30 minutes and the fans hate it. I give it two stars out of five. This match is not befitting the legacy of what these two guys had done before this, or even since this. I would argue Hardcore Justice 2010 in TNA was a better match than what we saw here in 1998 in their physical primes. You know, this match went 30 minutes, but you get the idea they only plotted for 20, because by the end, they're gassed, things are getting sloppy and repetitive, they're just desperate to make up sequences to make the match keep going. I think it would have helped things a lot if the ring announcer gave time cues as the match went on. Some had the crowd like, you know, stay excited for, and then by the end you have this dramatic countdown, because by the end it just kind of ends in this whimper, and it's not very good. Shane Douglas backstage talking about his injuries once again. He tells Al Snow he doesn't expect him to go easy on him tonight, but he'll have to kill Shane to win the championship, and whether he wins or loses, he'll go down as a fighting champion. Nice babyface promo from this very much heel champion. Like, the narrative on Shane has changed so drastically in the 24 hours before this pay-per-view, because the day before was an episode of Hardcore TV, and that's when they announced all these new injuries Shane's 
working through, and he's still going to do it, but like win, lose, or draw, it's going to be his last title defense for a long time because he's going to go in for surgery. So now we must all respect this, you know, brave warrior, Shane Douglas, who's an asshole who like threw the NWA title down and like shook Gary Wolf's neck halo and all this stuff. But let's, let's just give him respect for fighting through the injuries. So are we supposed to cheer him now for that? Or are we supposed to boo him because he's the same guy he's always been, this like cowardly heel surrounded by a triple threat and taking shots at Ric Flair, WCW country? How are we supposed to feel about this? And oh my God, the clip of Shane throwing down the NWA title. Look, WWE gets a lot of flack and rightfully so for how they've beaten fans over the head with the Montreal screw job for the last 20 plus years. But ECW is just as guilty at this time of exploiting this moment of Shane throwing down the belt and going, they can all kiss my ass. Like I've watched the five weeks of TV leading up to this show and they play that clip in its entirety twice in five weeks. And they show it again in the hype package that airs during this pay-per-view. Like seriously, it's just way too much. It's a four-year-old clip at this point. We then get an Al Snow promo. He says 16 years he's been in the wrestling business working to get this moment in the sun. How he never got the same breaks that Shane Douglas had because Shane was always a better looking wrestler. And he doesn't care how beat up or injured Shane is. He's going to do what he can to win that championship. Though I am getting kind of motion sick from watching all the camera moves here. And now it's time for the main event for the ECW title as Shane Douglas defends against Al Snow. Last year, Snow debuted for ECW as part of a talent exchange with the WWF. He took on his most famous gimmick here where he has snapped from so many years of being a jobber, starts talking to the mannequin head. Snow is insanely popular in ECW at this point. I would argue is popular or possibly more so than Taz at this moment. Everyone's got the foam heads in the crowd. They love the crazy gimmick. They filmed his entrances upside down for God's sake. At Living Dangerously, Snow beat Douglas in a tag team match and became number one contender in the process. And really the whole story in the bill for this up until at the 11th hour when they changed and talked about Shane's injuries was how Snow and the mannequin head was starting to get into Shane's head. And there's this great moment here in the build where Shane is getting all these foam heads thrown at him and he's kicking them out and trying to punch the air and get them out, making these big like blah, 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 kind of grunty noises. He's a very grunty man is Shane Douglas. Yeah. Come on. As the match begins, all the fans of their foam heads begin to like rub the heads together for this really creepy squeaking noise. Shane removing his arm brace to begin the match. The future Ultimate Deathmatch 2 co-stars begin by trading chops and Snow attacking the arm. As expected, Shane is somewhat limited in what he can do in this match. Head cheerleader of the triple threat, Francine, crotches Snow on the top rope at a crucial moment, but Snow gets Shane back on the outside, driving him into the ring post. Back in the ring, things are slow going. Fans are more interested in chanting things at Francine than focusing on the match itself. Shane sets up a whole bunch of chairs in the ring. He looks to go for something, but it turns into like a reverse atomic drop and Snow just kind of tumbles into the chairs. It looks really terrible. He makes up for it though with a powerbomb on the chairs. Snow begins to mount a really big comeback here as the fans just keep chanting, show your tits to Francine. Yeah, again, this match has not captured the hearts and minds of the people here in Marietta. But then Chris Candido runs in, but he's thwarted. Snow barely kicks out of Douglas's belly-to-belly -belly suplex. An acai moonsault to Candido and Bigelow fight on the outside. We notice the locker room has come out to surround the ring and watch this thing. Snow plow to Douglas, snow plow to Francine, head to Candido. Al goes for a very shitty sunset flipping the top rope. Shane sits on him and pins to win and retain. The fans hate this ending. Heads and trash are being thrown into the ring. I read reports there were chants of refund as the show is going off the air. The locker room fills the ring. Both men are held up and we get some sportsmanship as we fade to black. I'm going to give this one one star out of five. Oof. Shane, I'm sure you're a very prideful guy, but you probably should have sat this one out because this was not a good look for anyone involved. It was rough and slow going, and there were a couple of just really big, visible errors that probably could have been avoided here. And for as popular as Al Snow was at this time, not a good look for him. I think it really kind of just made him look like a chump. Despite taking time off for surgery and not coming back until September, Shane remained the champion the whole time, and we wouldn't get the much-hyped Shane-Taz title match until way later. It did, however, give us the birth of the FTW Championship for Taz. Meanwhile, Al came back to the WWF right after this to feud with Jerry Lawler and the team of Too Much to try and get rehired. Go watch my recently re-uploaded classic pay-per-view 
preview review of King of the Ring 98 for more information on that. If there's one thing I'll never understand during this time period, it's why Paul Heyman was so adamant that Douglas just had to be the champion. Oh, he has to keep the belt because we have to have Shane and Taz at some point, but he kept getting put off over and over again because Shane couldn't stay healthy. He got injured the night he won the belt in November of 97 and was off TV for a bit. The bulk of his reign at this time is him doing commentary with Joey Styles or cutting promos, talking about how hard he works. And like he rarely if ever wrestled during this time. If you're gonna like, in, in, in January of 99, when he ultimately does finally drop it to Taz, you could have just done that here tonight when Taz challenged Shane Douglas. You could have had an impromptu match, beat him in two minutes or whatever. Taz could have won the belt and then defended it against Snow later that night perhaps. Or you could have had Snow win the main event because he was so popular at the time and then drop it back to Shane when he comes back and then have Taz beat Shane later on. But nope, they went with like the worst possible ending of this. It kind of reminds me of when like Triple H was the world champion and he was hurt going into SummerSlam 2003 and the obvious choice was to have Goldberg win in the Elimination Chamber but then Triple H just beats him. Like that's what this reminds me of but it's so much more frustrating because Shane is so much more obviously uh, just handcuffed and handicapped because of his injuries to the point where he wasn't able to be a good fighting champion. When you hear about all of like the glory days of ECW, that's, there's a reason you don't hear about Shane Douglas as ECW champion. My grade for ECW Wrestlepalooza 98 is a D+. Plus. Now to go back to the top of the video when I asked is this the worst ECW pay-per-view in history, I'll put it to you this way. I have not seen all the ECW pay-per-views in history, but of the ones I have seen, this is the worst. There are a couple of matches on this show that seem good on paper but end up flawed in execution. Like RVD and Sabu was a total mess. Complete wrong creative direction for Douglas going over Snow in my opinion. Like one of the bigger creative blunders during the supposed glory times in ECW. New Jack was New Jack. You know, after pretty much from the NWA Legends tribute onward, the show takes kind of a big nose dive. And there are a couple of good matches here like the opening tag match and Whipwreck and Credible. But after that, A, those matches aren't so amazing and memorable that you have to watch this show. And B, after that, there's like nothing else that can top that kind of quality or entertainment value, in my opinion. If you're a diehard ECW fan, you can watch this show once and be content. And the silver lining is they do rebound quite nicely in the pay-per-view realm with Heat Wave later in the year. And if you want to hear my thoughts about that, I got the link to it right here in the corner. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to Patreon dot com slash wrestling with regret become a ten dollar backer or above and you'll have a chance to nominate classic shows for me to review well next time we're gonna go further back in the timeline to wcw because this show we saw wcw territory being invaded by ecw and this time they're going to be invaded by robocop i'm talking about capital combat 1990 i'm brian zane and i'll see you next time